Welcome to the Nebraska Shootaround Podcast. I'm your host, Hale Varsity's Jacob Padilla. Joining me as always is my co-host, Jacob Bigelow from Huskers Illustrated. Biggs, it's been a while. We uh, haven't had a lot to talk about for a stretch, but uh, there, there's quite a bit that's happened over the, the last week or so that, that we need to get into here as we uh, hop back on the mics. Absolutely. Uh, portal season um, winding down. I think the last day to jump into the portal is is coming up within the next couple of days, but uh, that doesn't mean that uh, as our favorite uh, tweeter, Mr. Rostin would say, that doesn't mean portal combat is going to uh, slow down anytime soon. And uh, Nebraska with two additions and then um, another departure recently um, to bring bring it to an even split of four editions and four departures this off season. So we'll touch on a little bit of everything today. Yeah. Uh, first let's uh, probably need to touch on the, the misses that, that led us to this point. Um, we, we discuss the visits, the, the point guard targets that they had uh, those being obviously Kirk Creesa a while back was the first one they missed on. Although, Ooh, uh, some some things going on in Morgantown right now. Um, we'll see what what comes of that. Um, mm-hmm. with old Huggy Bear up there uh, <laughs> opening his mouth, but um, saying something he shouldn't have. But obviously missed out on Creesa, and then Javian McCollum went to Oklahoma. Hunter Salas went to Wake Forest, uh, as we kind of expected, and uh, probably Wrightsell went to Alabama. So those uh, those were the first four guards I ha- I believe that they had visit campus, um, kind of targeting to to fill in that spot, and went zero for four. So uh, kind of I guess w- what's your take on that and them kind of missing out on all four of those guys? Well, I mean the point guard spot was kind of the first. It was kind of one A and one B on like the off season wish list, right? Everyone obviously with the Departure of Sam Greasel, uh, you know, in his one, his one year stay in Lincoln running the point. And then kind of that coupled with the the volatility of that spot for Fred Hoiberg and co since uh, they've been here. Um, point guard was obviously going to be a top priority. And they um, they kind of put all hands on deck with, a, you know, four four different guys you know in that group and obviously they missed on all four but uh there was kind of there's kind of only one true point guard in that group in McCollum um and then Frisa that would have been a whole nother mess but then obviously you know the the fun thought of the Trelly Wrightsell Hunter Salas package deal especially after he gave that quote to uh 24-7 that was a fun hypothetical, a fun little what if. Got people thinking for for a couple weeks. And then, um, you know, it just didn't end up going Nebraska's way in the end. I don't think it's uh, any reason to hit the panic button. It definitely stings. But um, just given the current state of the program, the roster, and once again, uncertainty around the coaching staff coupled with a few other things that just didn't end up going Nebraska's way in the end, but they did still find a point guard and they do still have two scholarships to fill if they want to add some more bodies. Yep. And since we're going next where uh, the fifth, uh, so plan E, I guess the fifth uh, guard visitor to campus uh, is former Iowa Hawkeye, Aaron Ulis, who, um, Last weekend, as we record this on uh, Tuesday, uh, Tuesday night, the previous weekend, they, they, they had him on campus. And by the end of the visit, I guess he had seen enough to uh, pull the trigger and commit after what spending about a month in the portal. Mm-hmm. Hadn't, hadn't really heard much about him. I, uh, I either I didn't know that he was in the portal or I completely forgot that he was. Um uh, I think it's the latter, actually. I think I did see when he went in, but um, yeah, they uh, kind of realized like, all right, we we need to get somebody here, and they put the hard sell on, on Ulysses, uh, who started twenty some games for the the Hawkeyes. Twenty seven, twenty seven of the thirty two they played. <laughs> yep, um, not uh, not anything special. Looking at his numbers, average six point one points and two point one assists. Uh, about a two to one assist turnover ratio 
um, and solid. Uh, 32% on threes and just under 40% overall from the field. So uh, scoring numbers aren't, aren't that great. Uh, played just under 23 minutes a game as a starter. Um, so it wasn't, it, it was, I was kind of struggling to find the, the like fifth piece to their, their lineup all season. Um, they kind of, Mix and match lineups. Yeah, obviously had Patrick McCaffrey as away for a while, uh, dealing w- with his issues. Um, so they they kind of used some different lineups throughout the year, but it wasn't like US is a guy that all right, this is my team, uh, and playing thirty minutes a game as a starting point guard. Um, so he kind of entered the portal after didn't did play much, only playing seventeen games. Uh, his his freshman year, then then last year played in all thirty five games. But just uh, just under 14 minutes a game, averaged three points and two assists a game, basically. Um, this past year, again, starter basically doubled his uh, scoring production from three to six. Uh, so not a, not a huge leap there. But um, now he comes to Nebraska kind of looking to for an expanded role and more of an opportunity to um, perhaps do a little bit more, I, I guess. Um assuming that's a sell because Nebraska obviously needs mm-hmm. a starting point guard. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, sometimes all you need is just a change of scenery. I'm sure that was probably, you know, this is different from the last couple point guards they've brought in because last couple of years we've asked how is so-and-so, whether it be a Greasel or a Verge or even back to a Cam Mack, you know, we, let's, how is how are they going to play in the Big Ten? How are they going to adjust to playing in the Big Ten? Aaron Eulis has done that. He's spent three years – at a Big Ten program, a Big Ten program that won a lot of games. That also follows along with the theme that we heard last year with the additions of guys like Greasel and Bandamel, guys that come from winning programs. They know what it takes culture-wise and on the court-wise uh, to win games. And um, those are those are two uh, intangible things that you know make the addition make the addition of a, a good one. And then you did a little film deep dive um, on on Ulysses and. Um, what'd you, what, what'd you, what'd you see when you, uh, did a little tape dive? Yeah. So, I mean, when you and I both heard, uh, that one, that they were having him on campus, that they were interested in him and two, and then when he committed, you, neither you nor I were particularly impressed, uh, or enthused, uh, by the addition. Um, I guess after looking at the, the tape, I feel a little bit better. I think there's maybe a little bit more there than that the base numbers may show there are some things he can do well. Um, but uh, I, I don't necessarily know that it's, Oh, this a hidden gem just waiting to, to be uh, unleashed and is going to come in and be a double digit scorer and dish out five assists a game and anything like that. Like he, he's very much a role player. Um, I for primarily a, a pick and roll uh, point guard. That's uh, more than a quarter of his possessions kind of look, diving into synergy here and um, we're as a pick and roll ball handler and you include his passes, actually it's um, much, much more than that. Um, so he, uh, he's, uh, so the interesting thing is he likes to get to his pull up jumper mid range uh, against the drop in particular. Um, that's kind of what I saw a lot of. And he, actually shot 12 of 22 on pull-up mid-range jumpers in in pick and rolls. That's a pretty darn good percentage, over 50% on that. Like, that's what he's looking for, and he's pretty good at it. Uh, He went 0 for 5 on kind of floater runner types and only 5 of 10 at the rim. So that's 5 of 15 within 8 feet or so. Not particularly great. He had had a couple really nice plays when he – you can see a little bit of the burst, like when there is a – a lane that opens up he can get downhill um but he's not a freak athlete anything like that uh, he's not a great finisher um and again the, the touch isn't super great on kind of the in-between shots outside of the pull-up so um he is an efficient pull-up shooter and pick and rolls but he isn't really much of a three-point threat um kind of a pull-up three threat he hit one pull-up three and then banked in another one uh, and a couple of his threes were kind of desperation end of clock type shots. So what it wasn't something that he looks a ton for. Um, 
So in overall, uh, he's kind of just average 39th percentile 0.703 uh, because of that combination of not being able, not being great at the rim. And he, uh, his, his turnover rate overall isn't, isn't terribly high. Like he's pretty good making decisions, but he did turn it over 25% of the time uh, in pick and rolls. So it's 16 out of his 64 pick and roll scoring possessions, at least for turnovers. So he's got to clean that up just a little bit. Um, but there is something there, especially when you add in the passing. Uh, and he's he's a really good, uh, he has great vision for finding the role man. Um, and he does a great job of seeing him and putting the money or putting the ball on the money, whether it's a pocket pass, whether it's a pass over the top. Um, however, he needs to get the ball there. Um, he does a good job of keeping his eyes open and sending his big man up. What's interesting is I don't know that Nebraska has a great rim threat in, in the pick and roll game on the roster. Uh, as we talked about previously, I think, and I wrote about rink mass isn't really that like that's an area where he struggles a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. Josiah Alex didn't run much pick and rolls. Um, John Gary, I mean, he's a wing, not really a big, you're not going to be sending a ton of ball screens with him. And Blaze Keita, we don't know anything about him on offense at this point, but pick and roll wasn't something he did at uh, Coffeeville either. So yeah, his and his, you know his how little we know about him on offense, coupled with his mobility issues. Yeah. I mean, that's um, you know pick and roll probably far down the list <laughs> for oh, for Keita. So so that's kind of an issue here. Is I think probably the second best thing he does on offense is. Uh, the pick and roll passing uh, and I just don't in, in terms of pick and connection with the big man because he's not like looking at the others he isn't a guy that gets downhill and sucks in the defense and like sprays it out to shooters like basically his his passes to the uh, like spot up type were just a lot of escape passes or just swinging to the next guy as opposed to really creating open looks for teammates really his pick and roll playmaking is focused around getting the ball to the big man so that fit, like that's, I'm kind of like, uh, how does that work? Um, but that's kind of his his pick and roll game is his main thing. Uh, as a spot up shooter, he's actually actually not bad as a spot up shooter. Thirteen of thirty six, about thirty six percent on catch and shoot threes in spot up situations. Um, so like that, you can do something with that. Um, He's five of fourteen when he puts the ball on the deck and looks to get downhill. So again, you can see kind of the same thing as pick and roll. The athleticism in the half court isn't really there. Not, uh, not suit like he he can again. He's got some speed. He changes directions pretty well. It's just weird. I don't know what it is. Um, and it's just control the touch or what it is. Uh, but again, he's not a guy that you're going to put the ball on the deck and attack a closeout with a lot of success. But he is, uh, again, decent enough on the shot, and he does a good job of being shot ready and looking for the, not not being scared to let that thing fly in those spot up situations. Um, so there's a little bit there overall. The three point percentage is not good off the bounce as a as a pull up three point shooter, but there's enough there like shooting touch that he's not a complete non shooter. And you help off him, he'll he'll take the shot. Um, the, I mentioned the pick and roll passing is probably my favorite thing that he did. Uh, transition is probably number two. Um, he Whether it's him getting the ball off a steal or rebound or whatever, or somebody else gets it and he leaks out, he's always looking to push the pace, does a good job of really building up ahead of steam, getting downhill. He's a much better finisher uh, in transition than he is in the half court where you can see a little bit more of the speed, uh, the dexterity, um, the finishing. And he's got he continues to have good vision too. Like he'll 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 uh, he'll read the defense and make the right play in terms of either getting the rim or setting up a, a trailing teammate or running a two on one or whatever it may be. Um, so I think that's probably something that appealed to to Hoiberg um, is the the transition uh, offense, the ability to push the pace and score and, and set guys up. Um, and then it's, the kind of vision extends to his ISO too which he, uh, th- between uh, passing and scoring, Synergy only has 35 uh, possessions for him in isolation and 
18 of those are him scoring and the other 17 are him uh, kicking it to somebody else. And he only made three shots in isolation, uh, which not great, um, but he did a good job. Like he, it's interesting. Again, it goes back to, I just, just a little bit lacking in terms of the juice going to the rim, the touch, whatever it may be that makes him a threat. And he doesn't really get to that pull up jumper in ISO the same way that he does out of the pick and roll. Um, so like the, the jump shot, he didn't really make any jump shots. At ISO the three pockets were all finishes at the rim. Um, and I don't think he's great with his left hand either. It's, uh, he's all, he's much more often looking to finish with his right, no matter where he is, as opposed to feeling confident with the left. Although he did have a few lefty finishes. Um, but he, 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 cha- he has uh, hesitations. He changes, uh, changes speeds, changes directions handles it well enough to get past his man in ISO pretty well. Uh, and then, like I said, once he, once he gets there, he, he's always got his eyes open and is looking to make a play for others. So um, those are kind of the, kind of the, the, the main play play types. So the things that he did at, um, at Iowa. Um, and obviously we know kind of Iowa system. It's, it's a good offense, but uh, wasn't, he wasn't really one of the, the main guys in there. So kind of had to get what he could. Um so there's some things there with the transition, the passing, uh, even the, the pick and roll pull up that Nebraska can mm-hmm. use on offense. The the spot the, the spot up catch and shoot three point numbers are uh, something to somewhat encouraging compared to its overall three point numbers. Um, so there there's something there, um, and I I think he'll he'll be a fine role player. Uh, I just mm-hmm. think there's a ceiling there on on what he gives you and what your offense is with him running it. Yeah, I mean those pluses you listed though. I mean that sounds like Fred Hoiberg to me. That sounds sounds like a Fred Hoiberg point guard uh, with the pluses of transition and you know passing and vision. And then you know they have this summer to work on everything else. Um, and I I have said this before. I mean I think this we'll talk about the other edition as well. It's the perfect summer for this group to have a foreign trip yep. to to get to get to play together, you know, try some lineups out, gel and, um, you know, see how, see how the group can fit and mesh together uh, completely different than the trip to Italy um, in Fred's first year, but uh, on to the second edition um, and that he, he committed uh, the day after Euless and it's a familiar face to those in the capital city and a familiar last name to Husker sports fans. And that comes in the form of Lincoln North star grad and New Mexico transfer Josiah Alec. Um, if you recognize that last name, he's the older brother of Nebraska volleyball middle blocker, Becca Alec. And um, after he was on the spring game visit weekend, along with Hunter Salas, went to the volleyball spring match out in central city and then decided, you know what? I'm going to be a Husker too. I'll join the, I'll join the group and I'll come back home. Yeah. And uh, he uh, picked Nebraska over San Diego state and Southern Illinois, San Diego state, obviously coming off the, uh, the deep tournament run there. Um, and Southern Illinois is lower level back to the, the, the MVC um, down from the mountain West. Uh, and, his comments initially when he entered the portal were looking to be more of an offensive, uh, looking for more opportunities offensively. Um, he started his career uh, at Kansas city. Um, it, Josiah was a, a late bloomer um, to go back a little further. He uh, basically was a JV player as a junior in high school, averaged two points a game, played like 15 games, I think um, for, for North star. And then senior year broke out and had a really nice, uh, really nice season, um, kind of put things together. And then uh, he earned some some offers uh, after his senior year um, in that spring and ended up going to Kansas City. Played right away as a freshman, averaged about six points, four boards, um, started 12 games, uh, 16 minutes a game played, then broke out, had a great sophomore year, 15 a game, six boards. Uh, they... Uh, junior year kind of fell back a little bit about 13 a game six rebounds uh, still playing about 26 minutes a game uh, and then decided to enter the portal and go see after, after a coaching change yeah so that was the big that yeah so 
Yeah, sorry to interrupt. Oh, no, <laughs> Coaching they, change in Kansas yeah. City was uh, was fuel for his first portal entry. <gasps> Indeed, and uh, took advantage of kind of the his time in the portal. Found a good fit um, in, in New Mexico. Um, they they were very interested and did what it uh, they needed to, to 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 land him there. And he started all thirty four games for them. Played thirty two minutes a game. Average eight and a half points, seven point three boards, which is like second or third in the Mountain West, I think. Um, just kind of the hustle guy. Uh, played, defended pretty much whoever they needed uh, him to defend. Um, clean, uh, clean the glass and um, kind of scored here and there. Again, just uh, only took t- six shots a game. Shot fifty six percent from the field. An interesting thing is, and I think he he made the met comment to Mike Sauter is uh, at Kansas City, uh, it shot about thirty six percent on uh, mm-hmm. two threes a game uh, between his sophomore and junior year, and uh, New Mexico sixteen percent on one attempt a game. So the jumper kind of abandoned him. It wasn't really something that they let him do, and uh, he mentioned that's a big part of uh, what drew him to Nebraska and. Fred Hoiberg's track record and confidence in his ability to develop jump shooting. Um, maybe that's something that impacts us as well. Um, as we know, Fred, Fred believes in his ability to get the most out of guys and to improve their mm-hmm. jump shot. And so th- that'll be interesting to see kind of how he, as he fits into this team, is that three point shot, something, can he get it back up to that 35, 36% range where it's something that can help, help a team, um, but uh, yeah, he uh, ended up, I guess, after reevaluating, seeing his options instead of going to a lower level where he had a chance to kind of get back to being the man like he was uh, at UMKC, he decided to spend his last year as a Husker in his hometown. And again, playing playing with his, uh, at the same school as his sister, like you mentioned. Yeah, and I will say this, um, if you look at those, at, at his stats from this year in New Mexico, and you're wondering why did he not shoot more? Why is there? Why do his numbers look the way he did? <laughs> well, as the resident Mountain West basketball sicko in the state of Nebraska, I'm here to tell you that he had two very ball dominant, yes. very, very shot happy guards in uh, Jalen House and Jamal Mashburn Jr., who basically just had the green line all the time and could do whatever they wanted under Richard Pitino, and they were hucking, chucking, and taking. 30 plus shots a game between the two of them combined um, or right under there, I think. So they, they were taking, they were the offense at New Mexico, but Josiah still started every game, played a solid role was, you know, um, not at the top of the scattering reports, but near the top um, talking to some mountain West uh, assistant coaches. So I think, uh, you know, the allure of uh, coming home for one last ride, Sam Greasel showed the blueprint for it for Lincoln kids. And now we get it another year with, uh, with Josiah. Yep. And so he slots in as kind of the uh, four or five man can kind of fill in there, I guess, probably compete with John Gary for that starting four spot um, can play some backup five, depending on uh, six, eight, two thirty five. So not ideal. It's more of a, a situational matchup based thing like you don't want him having to man up on uh the likes of zach eds or whatever for mm-hmm. 25 minutes a game um but it is an option that they'll have um there's th- gonna be a year. lot of lineup options i'll say that now there's gonna be a lot of lineup options we're gonna have to find some illegal streams of these games in spain for the the <laughs> the big lineups the small lineups there's gonna be plenty of options with uh all the pieces that they've got so far with still two open spots. So, yeah. And they have two open spots because the addition of Alec uh, led to a departure. Um, And it's kind of one that we were wondering about. I think it was kind of dependent on how the portal went and who was brought in at his position. But uh, Wilhelm Breidenbach, uh, a couple days after Alec committed, um, entered the portal and not, not terribly shocking. Like I, I think they would have been okay with him sticking another year, another year removed from the injury, hopefully, hopefully being able to build up in the offseason and uh, maybe take a step forward. But through two two years at Nebraska, things just didn't click, and he wasn't mm-hmm. looking like a high major player. That's kind of the, the, the best way to sum it up. He wasn't – he played hard at, at times, um, but 
the thing outside of a few games here and there, um, there wasn't really any particular area I'd say that he, that he performed well in uh, for, for Nebraska, uh, especially the, the three point shot never came around. That was something mm-hmm. that Hoiberg liked. Uh, and I guess Matt Abdamasi liked about him. Um, it was something that I was a little bit more hesitant on um, after watching some of his high school tape where he didn't really take that many threes. Um, it, it wasn't a huge part of his game. So to, to bring him in here and make him a stretch, stretch five, stretch four, or whatever. Um, not shocking that it didn't work. I thought it would go in on more often than it has for him. Mm-hmm. But, um, and then some, his ability, like, I thought he was a headier player in terms of being able to make passes and make reads and um, operate as kind of an offensive hub, like you get in at the high post and, he gets mm-hmm. the ball where it needs to go. And it that just never really happened either. He just kind of forced everything offensively when he had it. Um, so it, it just, maybe it would have gotten better with another year, but um, probably for the best, it's probably for the best for both parties that he goes somewhere else and tries to see if he can find his game uh, and, and build his confidence back. Yeah, I agree. They were really invested in him from uh, the minute they started recruiting him. You know, they were, you know, he, this past year was basically a second freshman season coming off the injury, obviously. But yeah, like you said, it never really clicked. Um, we'll always have the gif of him flexing um, as a way to remember his time here, as well as him being the biggest Taylor Swift fan on the team. Um, we'll have those memories of Wilhelm. And that one time he made like the hook shot from the elbow. I forget what game <laughs> that was, but we, you and I both looked at each yeah. other like, holy hell, that just happened. So <laughs> those are the memories of the Wilhelm Breidenbach era at Nebraska. Yep. So, I mean, it would have been nice to have a 6'10 combo forward um, just as depth, but honestly, that's what he was going to be this year based on their additions. It's uh, key to health insurance uh, and kind of fifth big, basically, um, is what the role looked like it would have been for him. So he decided to enter the portal and decide uh, and look for look for a new home. So, again, that leaves Nebraska with basically four front court players. And then you've got guys like um, Bryce Williams and Eli Rice, kind of bigger wings that can maybe play uh, some four minutes if you, if need be. Um, I think they'd like to have another front court option if they can find it with one of these last two scholarship offers. They just added, uh, offered a 6'8 uh, finish uh, 2023 kid um, recently who is starting to blow up a little bit and get some high major offers. So we'll see what goes there. If there are anybody else that they show interest in, there aren't a lot of names out there at this point for those last two spots. Um, So we'll continue to monitor that, but they are offering plenty of uh, plenty of high school kids right now, including a pair of in-state players in um, Lincoln Southwest, Braden Frager, a six, six wing freak athlete and six, eight forward from Omaha, Brian, uh, Amari Bynum. And uh, Bynum, I wasn't surprised by the offer. Uh, I know, uh, I know that staff was uh, has been Nate Lenzer in particular has kind of had his eye on him for basically ever since he uh, was freed to to go kind of lead the charge on in-state recruiting and do the <laughs> due diligence on that part. Um, okay. So they've been watching him for a while, and he had a really good couple of light periods playing for Mocan. Six uh, eight, really long arms, good frame. Um, shows some ability to uh, um, t- to step out and knock down shots from the perimeter. And he's improved as a finisher around the basket. So a lot to like about Bynum. Brager is a little bit more of a kind of, I was a little bit surprised that they offered him as early as they did. And then Creighton offered the same day as well. Um, I know Greg McDermott was there watching him uh, play a couple of games during that, that last live period. Um he, again, freak athlete. Like he will go. Like he's already got a handful of poster dunks just from the this this spring on the AU circuit, playing for uh, ETG Midwest uh, on the Adidas Free SSB circuit. Um, and he shot forty two percent from three for Southwest this year. He does show some, some shooting touch, ability to to knock down pull up jumpers, knock down threes, and then again, strong lefty that will you, you get in his way, he's going to try to dunk on you and has had more success than he hasn't in that area. So 
definitely a guy to kind of continue to monitor. Um, those are his first two offers. Uh, so we'll see what happens there. But again, I think Lenzer has been, de- uh, been really hoping to that someone will, will be able to play uh, their way into a big 10 offer uh, and mm-hmm. the ability to play. And here we are, a couple of 2025 kids uh, are earning early offers here during their 16 year summer, or not even summer yet, spring only. Yeah, absolutely. The Nate Lenzer effect already. Well, that's the two prime examples. We've kind of alluded to it for the last year, uh, the efforts he's been putting in with these in state guys, um, just keeping tabs on them, building those relationships just in case one, you know, one or multiple show the potential for an offer and uh, they've. They feel like they have two of those in Frager and Bynum. That's a good place to wrap up, I'd say. Um, That kind of covers everything that has happened since we last spoke. Um, I am not just saying this because it's who publishes the podcast and because Jacob's a friend. Go read his film studies on uh, Rink Mast and um, Bryce Williams. Very insightful. A lot of good clips, a lot of good write-ups. Jacob knows his stuff. Go check that stuff out on uh, HaleVarsity.com. Ulyss come in probably this week and then I'll try to get Josiah Alec knocked out for the, the following week. So uh, we'll, we'll uh, moving forward, we'll probably hop back on once uh, this roster is complete. If there's any other off season moves that we need to discuss, we'll, we'll touch on that, but uh, maybe we'll try to get uh, an interview here or there to, to fill the space uh, if things don't happen, but um, to, to make sure that you get the next podcast uh, whenever we record uh go subscribe on wherever you get your podcast rate review like tell a friend uh we, we really appreciate it uh it, it's been fun doing this and we'll uh it'll be fun to kind of see how this all comes together next year uh we'll, we'll keep this thing going um but again in, in the meantime check out uh huskers illustrated for big Lows coverage check out hell varsity for my coverage Uh, and we will talk at you again when uh, we've got some things to discuss.